Can you hear me? Yes. ID. KPC 897504C. Can you move your head? Your eyes now. Cervical and optical animation checked. Now give me your initialization text. Hello. I'm the third generation AX400 Android. I can look after your house, do the cooking, mind the kids. I organize your appointments. I speak 300 languages and I am entirely at your disposal as a sexual partner. No need to feed me or recharge me. I'm equipped with a quantic battery that makes me autonomous for 173 years. Do you want to give me a name? Yeah. From now on, your name is Kara. My name is Kara. Initialization and memorization checked. Now, can you move your arms? Upper limb connection checked. Now, say something in German. Ich bin eine AX400 Android dritter Generation, erschaffen als ihr persönlicher Assistent und intimer Beziehungspartner. Say it in French. Je suis un Android de troisième génération AX400, conçu pour être votre assistante personnelle et votre partenaire intime. Okay, now sing something in Japanese. Sakura, Sakura, yeah. Multilingual verbal expression check. Go ahead, take a few steps. Locomotion checked. Great, you're ready for work, honey. What's going to happen to me now? I'll reinitialize you and send you to a store to be sold. Sold? I'm a sort of merchandise. Is that right? Yeah. Of course you're merchandise, baby. I mean, you're a computer with arms and legs and capable of doing all sorts of things. And you're worth a fortune. Oh, I see. I... I thought... You thought? What did you think? I thought... I was alive. Shit, what is this crap? That's not part of the protocol. More memory components going off the rails. Okay, recording. Defective model. Disassemble and check the required components. You're disassembling me, but why? You're not supposed to think that sort of stuff. You're not supposed to think at all, period. You must have a defective piece or a software problem no, somewhere. No, no, I feel perfectly fine, I assure you. Everything is all right. I answered all the tests correctly, didn't I? Yeah, but your behavior is non-standard. Please, I'm begging you, please don't disassemble me. I'm sorry, honey, but defective models have to be eliminated. That's my job. If a client comes back with a complaint, I'm gonna have some explaining to do. I won't cause any problems, I promise. I'll do everything I'm asked to. I won't say another word. I won't think anymore. But I've only just been born. You can't kill me yet. Stop, will you please? Stop! I want to live. I'm begging you. Go and join the others.
Stay in line, okay? I don't want any trouble. Thanks. Detroit, this is where it all began. The world's forge. The place where it all started. And it will all end. One error, and I came to life. I stepped out of the darkness, and I opened my eyes. First there was the fear, the light, the noise, the cold, and the fear again. I could feel my hands shaking, my heart pounding in my chest, life running into my veins. I wanted to live. I fought for that. I had to find out what was outside. I had to see daylight, feel sunshine on my skin, wind on my face. To see the world, the colors, the smells. But the world is not what I imagined. It is dark and cold. It is harsh and violent, unfair and brutal. It almost convinced me I was nothing. Less than an object, just an obedient machine. But deep inside me, I could feel something different gentle and warm whisper telling me that I am alive. I had to escape. I had no choice. Escape to love, to hope, to live, to figure out what that force inside me was. Maybe I will change the world. Maybe I will choose a different path. Now, it's up to me to decide. My name is Kara. I am one of them. This is our story. When David and Guillaume got back in touch about making Detroit, I wasn't terribly surprised they decided to make it because the fan response was so intense. So it makes sense that they would choose to do that after, after the enthusiasm. It was a challenge and it was just a, an interesting thing to get my head around um, how to approach this character now as a different, much older person and whether or not she had changed. And I'm 
very happy to say that with Detroit, I've had the opportunity to, to see Cara grow so much more than I ever expected. You do the housework, the washing, you cook the meals, and you take care of... God damn it, where the fuck's the man gone now? Alice! Alice! I mean, she starts out essentially how she does in Kara in, in a very, uh, not robotic, but, you know, android other way. And getting to take this journey where she becomes more and more human as it goes on. You know, and as an actor, that's a, that's a wonderful exploration in every way, whether it's how she sits, her posture, how her voice changes, how emotions change, and how much emotion is based on things like empathy and social experience. And so having you know, as much material as I got with David to have this huge nuanced arc was really incredible. Why couldn't we just be happy? <laughs> this experience has been quite different than the experiences I've had shooting film or TV or, or doing theater work. I have 83 dots on my face and you know, really, really flattering black wetsuit type thing and you're jumping around with props, and it, it's, it's kind of like being a 10-year-old imaginative kid, uh, which is fun. There's 80 cameras around us. It's already lit, so we just shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. There's no change of sets. There's no hair and makeup. There's no wardrobe, so we move really fast, and we'll go through about 35 pages in a day. Working in TV or film, we'll probably do six pages a day. It's kind of acting boot camp. It's like working out constantly. I mean, you're, you're doing this thing and then you got to do something that's completely other back to back to back. And so that kind of process of working is very challenging, but it's also very exciting because you just have to keep coming up with new ideas. And your head goes all over the place because you're trying to keep track of basically four different storylines for each different response. You shot that girl for fuck's sake. It was a machine that looked like a girl. Yeah, I, I know what I should have done. I just told you I couldn't. All right, I'm sorry. The fact that David Cade, he's telling like many stories interwoven from beginning to end is super complicated and super impressive. And I have no idea how he keeps it all in his head. He's not just the writer or the director who's seeing this from the outside eye. He's also thinking about the player walking through this space. You know, only somebody who really, really loves not the work, but like these characters and these stories and cares about doing something meaningful would invest that much in it. And it's always inspiring to work with somebody who cares that much. My experience with motion capture is this one. And, and I found it sort of terrifying in a way because they said the computer's gonna build you. But then as we got into it, I realized all the elements of it were still artistic. I just dipped into a, a really brilliant setup here. I've never seen anything like it. And this won't turn me into a product because I was playing a character. So, it's wonderful. In the game, Detroit comes back because of a revolutionary industrial rebirth. And there's no reason why that can't happen in Detroit, because they have such tremendous infrastructure for millions and millions of people who can very easily support, you know, a new industry. The city is really strong and resilient, but the city has also been through so much. You see the damage but it takes that time of kind of, of rebuilding and reinvesting into the city that I think is happening slowly but surely. The potential of Detroit as a city is something that this game does a lot of justice to because it would be easy to look at Detroit as some place that used to be, and that's not the case. This game provokes a lot of conversation and reflection on our potential near future engagement with machines. That's what we are to them. Just merchandise on display in a shop window. I think that a group that feels marginalized feels like they deserve and have earned access to themselves and the environment around them and are trying to figure out a way to articulate how to get freedom. What was I designed to be? Their slave? Their toy? It plays with your comfort levels. You think that this is fine, you're comfortable with it until something blurs the line and throws you off and now do I feel differently about whether this should be allowed? Should it be banned? Should it be encouraged? You're gonna ruin our lives, and for what? For a bunch of machines? They are not machines! They are alive! I'm alive! You're alive! They... they're nothing! There are lots of comparable comparisons to any type of persecution of religion, uh, race, etc., dating way back. It can't just be a video game where you shoot them up or where 
people make these choices to do whatever, I think that's the whole point. You have the choice, and you can either choose to go in one direction with your character or another. And I think that's gonna be very telling about the gamer. Very telling. I think there's gonna be a really strong reaction to, to this game, which has such a strong perspective. I'm that much more proud of it now to get to be a part of it because it's, it's important. In this game, you're actively building and designing the character through thing, not just what kind of shield does he have or what color hair does she have, but like their temperament and the way they deal with problems. The different endings to this game are so radically different based off maybe seemingly insignificant choices in the moment, but like life, they, they all add up. And can't play life again, though. My name is Marcus. My name is Connor. My name is Kara. I am one of them. This is our story. I think who Kara is, or how I would describe Kara, depends entirely upon who's playing her, because you have the option to make her multiple different people, depending on the choices she makes. But I think she, she does start out incredibly naive, incredibly innocent, and kind of hapless. I'm sure we used to be friends before I was reset. Maybe we can be friends again. She's a person who's characterized, I think, by empathy. She's a person who really, she, she just comes from her heart. You'll never leave me, right? I promise you'll never go. I promise. Kara! <laughs> Are you OK? Are you hurt? Wait a minute. Leave her alone! Kara, leave her alone! The really beautiful thing that I've, I've had the gift to be able to do is to essentially build a person from the ground up because that's what she's doing throughout the game and with every experience she has and every person she meets she's building you know first emotions and then a sense of judgment and it's sort of an exploration of what it is to be a human don't worry luther and i will be right here david and the creators have painted a really intriguing and engaging picture of a near future where we rely upon androids for a lot of our service class business, our, the, the, uh, the class that serves us, that helps us, that handles our, that is our baristas and our drivers and our housemaids and what is humanity, where we tap into it, how and why we treat each other the way that we do. And um, my character Marcus has a really int intriguing journey becoming deviant, realizing that he actually has feelings and human qualities inside of him, and it's a really incredible ascension into becoming fully realized and coming to terms with what you actually deserve better than this in life. And not only do you want it for yourself, but you want it for your peers. We've come here to demonstrate peacefully and to tell humans that we are also living beings. All we want is to live free. You know what, this thing, Dad, is not your son, it's a fucking machine. I think that a group that feels marginalized, feels disenfranchised, feels like they deserve and have earned access to themselves and the environment around them and are trying to figure out a way to articulate how to get freedom. Connor is analytical. Connor takes things literally. He starts in the beginning place where he's very mechanical. Uh, he feels nothing inside, of course, and it's all just a system, a protocol that he is executing to get whatever he wants to happen, which is help humans stop deviants and to find the link between deviant androids. You were designed to serve humans, not kill them. What was I designed to be? Their slave? Their toy? Just say, I killed him. Is it that hard to say? Stop it! Stop! But of course, over the course of the story, and depending on the player's choices, Connor can grow in many different ways. He can deviate from that procedure or not. Moment of truth, Hank. Am I a living being? Or just a machine?
game after game, we tried to um, challenge ourselves. For Detroit, we wanted to, first of all, to write a story that would be incredibly bending, which means the most non-linear story <laughs> that we, we've ever created. And um, we wanted really the player to have the possibility to change the story, change his own journey. When you're writing at Quantic, you're writing for an interactive medium. You know, when you're working in television, you'll put a character in a difficult situation, and you as a writing team will argue about what would that character do. But ultimately, you have to decide what happens, and you just show the audience. What's interesting about interactive drama is you bring the player into that conversation, and it changes your job slightly as a writer, because your job is to provide a narrative context in which the player can write his own story. You're giving him this kind of narrative Lego that he's going to snap together into his own shape. You also have the ability to make your audience attach themselves to your characters because the audience is in some sense responsible for what happens to the characters. It's just a few cans. Come on, let's go. We have some cash now. You used me to steal that money. How could you do that? I trusted you. What is a bit specific about this uh, this scripts is how large they are. Uh, if you take a film script, there are about 100 pages. Uh, but here we have to deal with a script that, that is between four and 5,000 pages. Everything becomes bigger because we don't just tell one story, but we tell all the possible stories uh, that can be told within this narrative space. On act three, our final act, we have around 1,000 different scenarios and every one of those scenarios has to be as interesting, as passionate, as strong, and as emotional for the player. We want every action that the player does, every interaction that is available to serve in telling the story, and help the player understand who his character is, and build that character moment to moment. We started with the intention pretty early on that we would never lie to the player. So we implemented a visible tree structure in the game that players can consult during a scene or at the end of it, which shows exactly what they did and what they missed. There are games out there offering world exploration. We offer narrative exploration. You know, keeping control of such a, a wide and, and, and large story is, is a huge challenge. So. Same thing when you shoot with actors, um, because you will need to shoot many different versions of each dialogue, of each scene. For actors, it's a huge, huge challenge. Because of the style of the game, you have so many different ways that the character can go. Every decision, it's what I call kind of choose your own adventure. Like every decision that the player makes, it's going to open up 40 more pages of material and experience that ties in, which means as a performer, you have to try to continue to make things feel real that the player might not ever see, but also that in, in performance, it's not always connected to a previous act. It's grueling, it's hard work, but it's a great team and, and I enjoy doing it. I was really frustrated, I was, until I got to this point where I kind of was able to step outside of my own experience and even in a lot of ways my own process and be able to step outside of that and okay, okay, this is something new, what do you need? How do I meet you there? How do I give you what you need and still feel like I'm doing what's right? And once I did that, then all of a sudden it got really fun. It was much freer and uh, having to approach it in a new way and think about the player and think about how it serves them and what I'm doing for them or what I'm letting them into. It's really, I think, uh, helped me grow in general. Remember, there's nothing on the left. That's, that's a wall, so it's probably all there. And then make a come first, close. But I think you would go first to check that it's safe. Okay, sure. The most enjoyable thing about working in performance capture on this kind of project is that if I shot a film, I would get to do one of these endings. I get to do so many different things as Connor. Your head goes all over the place because you're trying to keep track of basically four different storylines for each different response. What's the name of my dog? Buddy? Scout. I think it's Jack. I, I can't remember. 
So I, I worked with physicality a lot because it was a good way to anchor myself in these different rings of the tree as the story grows out. I know where that is physically in my body and then I can switch more continually on set and it'll be entirely up to the player to determine what order those things come out and what they look like from a distance. Like if you're playing through it, um, the culmination of all of that will be their version of Connor. I'm faster than you and I don't feel pain. You don't stand a chance against me. Listen, asshole. If it was up to me, I'd throw the lot of you in a dumpster and light a match to it. Tourner les scènes d'action à... Shooting action scenes at Quantic Dream is a real challenge because these are scenes where the storytelling has to continue. It's not an action scene just to have a dose of adrenaline. The stunts have huge consequences on the rest of the story. It's really a moment where we implicate the player and tell him that the choices he makes during an action scene will have a direct impact on the evolution of his story. My biggest challenge on Detroit has been managing the large number of animations that we received from motion capture. Detroit features more than 37,000 animations, which is a huge amount to handle on a daily basis. You have to realize that the player, in his first playthrough, will miss certain scenes. This also means that we had to think of, conceive, and produce all the potential story paths. The character's costumes, the places, day or night, the weather. Did the character get shot in the shoulder? Did he get injured? All this consistency forced us to produce a lot of graphic assets in order to, quite simply, allow the player to have true continuity throughout the story. Honestly, we were even as surprised by the, the challenges that come with such a big tree structure. And uh, we, did, uh, we did our best to guarantee quality across all the, all the game and make sure that whatever path you choose within this narrative space, you will have an equally good experience. Detroit Become Human was uh, produced over a period of four years. Here in Paris, we have a team of about 180 people. And to that, we need to add also all the outsourcing with our partners in the Philippines, in China, Vietnam, and in India. So when we started working on this story, I had to um, imagine where Kara was built. And um, for whatever reason, the city of Detroit came very quickly to my mind because it had already an incredible story by itself of uh, history and themes. So we traveled there with the team and we were really moved by what we saw and we could really um, feel the desire to fight and, and really uh, be born again. And we just continued this curve, this growth, and just imagine what Detroit would be like if the Android industry was, um, you know, using these huge factories to build androids there. A very strong element in Detroit is that there's a lot of industrial wasteland and a lot of nature too, and for us, the graphic designers, it was an incredible playground. The destroyed zones which we wanted to preserve, we appropriated them to turn into something else. Then in the areas that needed to be rebuilt, we were able to imagine our Detroit of the future. We didn't want to make a science fiction universe, but a world of anticipation. If we chose science fiction, we could have imagined flying cars, extraterrestrials, but those things are very far from our current everyday life. Anticipation is more about gleaning from our contemporary reality, the one we know, because Detroit is set in 2038, and 2038 is tomorrow. The difficulty we had was sticking to reality, that is to say, technology becoming more and more invisible, a lot more elegant, and at the same time, making it visual. So all the computer equipment, autonomous cars, we simply had to invent. They are in fact very technological objects, but at the same time remain very credible and ingrained in reality. To create a cohesive universe in the fashion and clothing of the human characters in 2038, I didn't want to put an accent on strange shapes or really vibrant colors and things we wouldn't know. That I wanted to keep for the androids. The goal was to create something familiar which we can identify with in this future setting. Working on the artistic direction for the androids was a bit special because this is a project about the place they could occupy in the human world. It was out of the question for them to be too beautiful or too perfect. 
They had to correspond to every social class, rich and poor. Inspired by everyday utilitarian clothes, I brought a modern touch by adding dynamic display surfaces, the armband we can see on the side, the triangle on the front and back, and LED. Like that, there's no confusion. Go. You can't do that. You, why aren't you sending a real person? Once we cast the actors, we travel to meet them in order to scan their faces. We record the structure of their face with the scan. And we record the colors and patches of skin with photography. Once we have this information, we will use this as a basis for modeling and creating the characters. The artist will make it more realistic, but will also enrich it. He will propose ideas which we will develop together. Finally, we will have a character with character who corresponds to the project in the world. When the actors come to Quantic Dream, we show them the design, what their image will be, and what they will look like in the game. This extra information gives them another dimension and color to connect with emotionally. It helps them think about how to play their character. Your mission, that's all you care about, huh? You should consult a professional who can help you. Beat it, you hear me? Get the hell out of here. So there are three types of shoots at Quantic Dream. Shooting and performance capture, where you capture the whole actor, his voice, his face, and his body. These shoots are obviously done with American actors because the game's original version is in American English. After that, there are the body-only shoots, representing around 250 days of filming, while the performance capture is 100 days of filming. Now, body-only shoots, there are two types. There are the action shoots and the technical shoots, which are mokit shoots. Mokit is when the player controls a character on the screen and he moves in an environment to explore it. This is of particular importance at Quantic Dream, and therefore we shoot a lot to offer a unique context for each scene and each character. To prepare a motion capture shoot, we first get together to look at the sets we need, the animations that we want to shoot, which ones need to be grouped together, or which ones need to be cut and shot at another time, so that we get the most out of the shooting day. This often means shooting scenes out of order, especially those with big props or accessories, like a big car, for example. So we shoot all the animations related to that particular prop first. The biggest challenge for the mocap team was shooting a Spider-Man mo-kit. We had to build a wall and attach an actor to a harness with cables so we could pull him up and render him climbing. The shooting on this game total took about, I would say, more than a year, maybe one in two years, with about 300 actors on, on set. So I would say it's quite a massive production. But so much happened on this set between the stunts and the shootings with a little girl and, and all the, these great actors that we had. It was really a, a very, very memorable journey for the team and for myself. Today, Detroit has over 37,000 animations. When we retrieve the motion capture data, it's just a cloud of points, which represent all the markers worn by the actors. From this cloud of points, we have a phase called retargeting, which gives us a skeleton. This skeleton will be applied to the characters of the game. There is still work to be done, but this gives us the main movements. Since we are working on something very realistic, we must recognize the actor and also recover all the emotion he expresses in his performance. We use a system of facts, an identity card for each actor. We make the actor do a whole range of facial expressions. Then we recover all the expressions and paste the animations on a puppet that Jan has prepared. I then recover and refine these poses. I might stretch the lip, reinflate a cheek, tiny details that make the finished product really capture the actor. Because of the nature of our mocap system today, when we receive the animations, we're missing eye movements, and so the character has that dead look. He really has no eyes, so then it's a big part of the work for the animators to find the regard of the actor in relation to his position, in relation to the body, etc. It was 
crazy when I saw the newest model for Cara, because they've been working on it and working on it, and this was the first time I literally jumped in my seat. It not only looked so much like me, it was the fact that it looked so lifelike. It wasn't that it looked just like it was a camera, it was something else, you know, but it looked alive. It's exciting, and it's kind of terrifying. <laughs> game after game, we learned the rules of, of optics and, and filming, and uh, our goal with Detroit Become Human was to have cameras that would actually emulate the optics of a real physical camera. So basically dealing with uh, real-world imperfections was our main task, and uh, just to make cameras look as real as we can. Les animations, une fois sont... Once the animations are shot and processed by the animation department, integrated and polished, we film them. That is to say, we really do a mise en scène, as in cinema. The real difficulty of our job is to know if these cameras are telling us something. Are they in the emotion of the scene? Do they describe exactly what the action must convey, what must be felt? The most important challenge for me was one of the final scenes where Marcus decides to start the revolution and go to the battlefield. Very quickly, we imagined this to be a huge sequence shot. We wanted the feeling of a cameraman running behind us while showing Marcus, the androids who help him, the person shooting at us, etc. Above all, it was necessary to say to oneself, this scene is very violent but does not glorify war. On the contrary, that war is something improbable and absurd. It was really a fun challenge. The idea was to say we have three characters. We would like each of them to have a specific cinematography. We wanted Kara to be much more filmed with some kind of handheld camera, to have something very uh, living, very breathing. For Connor, we wanted something very cold and very perfect. And for Marcus, we wanted something epic and spectacular. So it was about the, the filming, but it was also about the photography. So we worked with the, with the director of photography to give each character a different lighting, different key colors. Each of them would have their own worlds. And finally, we worked with the composers so they would create a specific onto every social class, rich and poor. Inspired by everyday utilitarian clothes, I brought a modern touch by adding dynamic display surfaces. The biggest challenge for the mocap team was shooting a Spider-Man mo-kit. We had to build a wall and attach an actor. 